Joining me today is the host of the Relatable Podcast, a speaker, a commentator, and a cat person, Ali Stuckey. Welcome to the yes. Ruby Report. Thank you for having me. All right, Stuckey, I have wanted you in the studio for quite oh, some time. Oh, I'm so time. glad to be here. It is good to have you here, but we got I got two bones to pick before okay. we do anything else. Oh, gosh, else. does it have to do with cats? Number one, you're a cat <laughs> person. What's going yeah, on there? I am, you just I, met my a, dog. What, yes, what are you and I love about? your dog. She's so sweet. I love dogs. I have a dog. She's a rescue. I have two cats. Cats are just... They're cool and they're easy. They don't need that much of your time, that much of your attention. I travel a lot like you do. And so it's nice to just be able to leave the cats, but you gotta put a dog in a kennel. You gotta pay a bunch of money. They need your time, they need your attention, they need to go outside. Cats are cool. They but don't really cats, wanna hang out with you. Cats are plotting to kill you most of the time. That, They're know, looking at you, they, you know, they could lunge at you at any moment. You know, that's a stereotype that I would expect someone on the left to make, <laughs> but thats it's not true. You have to take cats by their individual personalities and not categorize them. Look at how you just used identity politics against me, just right, like that. Right, right. Yeah. It applies to the animal kingdom too. I just needed you to know. All right, that's number one. Okay. We're just gonna have to agree to disagree okay, on cats it. and dogs. Number two, for about two years, I had the number one PragerU video. Okay, oh. why I left the left. Sorry. Then you came in there, you took number one away from me, but actually, I don't know if you know this, as of the last couple of days. Did you eclipse me? Somebody else took number Who? one. I don't, I'm not even So gonna, we need to get them in the, here. Now we have a bone to pick with them. Yeah, wow. I actually can't remember who it was um, or what even the topic was. Okay. I saw it this morning and I was like, I don't even want to know. I don't even want to know. But you, uh, you was, what was the title of it? It was Masculinity. I think it was like Make Men Masculine Make Again. Make Men Masculine Again, yeah. Or something like that. So I guess that was a hot topic that people really wanted to hear about. I mean, it was so fun to make. Obviously, you've made Prayer You video too, but I didn't really anticipate it being one of those viral videos, I kind of just thought, okay, most people in general agree with me, but the vitriol, of course, that it got, you, you just, you're continually surprised by some people on the left who are so opposed to what are very traditional ideas, so. Yeah, all right, well, we're gonna talk about some of those traditional ideas. Yeah. We'll talk, talk about masculinity and Me Too and a whole bunch of other stuff. Cool. But for people that don't know you. Yeah. Where did you come from? What's going on here? Yeah, so I started in this whole kind of political, I won't even say media field, but kind of, about three and a half years ago. So fall of 2015, I was working in PR, graduated from college in 2014. PR, social media, just had kind of your normal agency job. But in fall of 2015, I lived in a college town, Athens, Georgia, and I looked around and the friends that I had, both in college and out of college, had no idea what was going on in the election. It was the primaries, and I thought, these are really smart people. And a lot of them are conservative in their values, and yet they seem to be touting the these progressive views when it comes to politics and they really have no idea what's going on and so I really just kind of had a, a random idea when I was driving one day called my mom and I said you know I think I want to tell sorority girls why they should vote in the primaries because hmm. they seem so apathetic I feel like I can talk to this crowd because I was a sorority girl about a year before that and so I created this it really was a nonpartisan presentation um, for for college students for why they should vote in the primaries and I started reaching out to uh, the sorority presidents and you can find that information online I just said can I please come I want to speak for free it's gonna be nonpartisan I just want to tell you guys why you should vote in the primaries and it worked I mean I started speaking to some of these groups and then I started getting asked uh, by other organizations on and off campus uh, to come speak and then from that I started a blog and that was called the conservative millennial ditch the nonpartisan thing pretty quickly and then <laughs> after uh, a few months of doing that I started making videos and that's kind of when it took off so end of 2016 beginning of 2017 is when it probably officially became a career I started working at the blaze and then that changed to I moved to CRTV that's where I started my podcast and that was the beginning of 2018 yes I'm getting my years confused beginning of 2018 that I started the podcast so still speak still commentate um, I still write, still do a lot of the same things I was doing three and a half years ago. It's just involved into a full-time thing. Yeah, it's pretty sweet when you start doing something and next thing you know, it's it becomes actually something. become something. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, not bad. Uh, do you come from a political family or anything? Did you care a about little. politics before this or was that just your wake up when you realized nobody knows what they're talking about at college? I would say both and. Mostly, mostly the second one. I, I grew up in 
I wouldn't say it was an apolitical home. I knew we were conservatives and I knew we liked the, the earliest president that I really remember is George W. Bush. And I was really young during 9-11 and I remember the patriotism that my parents showed and that we were supposed to show. I knew we were supporting George W. Bush and we kind of grew up watching Fox News. But politics, it, it wasn't a discussion that we had at the dinner table necessarily. I just knew the values that we had. My parents uh, were entrepreneurs. They came from very poor families in Arkansas. They had no money when they got married. They were 19 and 20, and they really went from nothing and then built a business and built a life for my brothers and for me that was so much better than the ones that they had. And so the idea of freedom, of entrepreneurship, of not having a cap on your potential was just always really attractive to me. So there was never a time in college, high school, even as a rebellious teenager that I was like, you know, more government control actually sounds really good. It just <laughs> it just never, never occurred to me that that would lead to a better life. I just always loved the entrepreneurial spirit and the idea of the American dream that my parents embodied. So it was more of those values rather than talking about politics. My dad did become a state representative um, when I was in college, I think it was 2012. And so yeah, that probably Probably spurred some interest. I started probably getting uh, more knowledgeable and more informed about actually what was going on. But yeah, I would say it's more a lifelong value building thing. And then by the time I graduated college, I was like, oh my gosh, I feel like our nation is kind of at a crisis. How does religion play a role in that? It plays a huge. It plays a huge role. You know, we hear a lot, especially from people on the left. Uh, that your religious view should have have no impact on what you believe politically. Well, that's just uh, a false idea of of religion and a false idea of your faith. If the if your faith is the center of your life, which religious people believe that it should be, then it's going to affect everything. It's going to affect all of your values. It's going to affect probably how you vote, um, and it's going to affect the the things that you believe in politically and the way that you think that the country should go. And so, being not only uh, a born again Christian but also a Protestant Christian. Um, having roots in even the Protestant Reformation and how that kind of affected the, the movement of the West towards freedom and towards individual liberty, I think has certainly been a legacy that was passed down to me. And it all just, it all has always made sense. I wish I had like a better journey story of, of changing <laughs> my mind, but the idea of individual liberty and human dignity and all of the rights that come with that, it just, it just always made sense. The stories that come from a little more of an evolution, they, they involve yes. more violence and pain and anger Yes, and but they're interesting. They make and, for a good story. Yeah, they make for a good book. Perhaps. Yeah. Perhaps. Perhaps, maybe. I don't know. Um, so when you got into the online world and started posting videos yeah. and podcasting and all that, um, were you shocked at sort of the, the tenor and the way people talk about these things and all that? Well, you know, when I first started, when I first started the blog and then I started doing videos, I mean, one, I had no money, no backers, no idea what I was doing. And the, I mean, the first videos that I did are in my living room. I have no makeup on, no lights. I'm using my phone, look ridiculous, got no views whatsoever. And so it was after I persisted for a little bit, sometimes I look back and I'm like, why did you even persist? No one was telling you to, but you did. And then it's really the first time that you get any kind of attention or affirmation that you also see the other side of it, uh, that you also see the negativity. When you're just doing it kind of for yourself and for the few people that follow you, you're like, this is great. Yeah. Everyone loves me. The three people that follow me all love me. My parents and my husband love what I do. This is great. <laughs> but then as soon as something kind of blows up, yeah. as they say, you you see the negative side of it and you realize, okay, people don't just disagree with you, they really hate you. And they really think that you're a bad person, especially if you espouse any kind of faith that immediately comes into question if you disagree with them. And that was hard. I mean, I used to focus on the comments a lot. You have to stop doing that though. It's so unhealthy. So that's kind of, uh, that's changed over the past few years, definitely. But uh, yeah, I think the hatred threw me for a loop at first. Yeah, well, it just sort of comes and you don't really know what to do. And then at some point, I think I've come around to the place where it's like, the more I get, I'm like, oh, I must be doing something right. Yeah. Because right. people used to lie about what I was saying and I didn't yeah. like that. Now they actually quote me and I'm like, oh, right. well, this is actually, right. well, this must be feel like when you made it. You know? I, I think it was actually you that tweeted the other day some article by Right Wing Watch. Yeah. Was that you? And, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. They, they did an article on me not that long ago too. They quoted something that I said at CRTV. And of course, everything looks like it's some hit piece. But then I read it and I'm like, 
That's what I. No, that's what I said. It was the, one You're of the right. first ones. I was like, this is an actual, basically an honest piece. Because right. They were really quoting. They just quoted me. you exactly, yeah. and I'm like, if people think that's crazy, I'm totally fine with that. Yeah. But like you said, don't lie about. Don't lie about what I'm saying. But yeah. yeah. Is it unique to be a woman in this space? Use a little identity politics here. I thought Republicans and the right, I thought they hate women. Yeah. They don't listen to women. Don't they subjugate women? Yes. And don't they, they do. Want to I keep just you like being subjugated. Barefoot and pregnant. Weird. You are pregnant, but I am you know. pregnant, but I am wearing shoes. And so I am I'm shoes. against that part of it. <laughs> no, I, I've never I've never really understood that argument. I guess if you equate women's rights to abortion and to this mythical gender wage gap that needs to somehow be filled by the government, if you equate women's rights to that and women's empowerment to that, then sure. Um, I guess the left is the only place for women. But if you believe in entrepreneurship, if you believe um, in the marketplace, if you believe that women have the potential and the dignity that a man has and the potential to do everything that a man does in a way, at least as far as her career goes and leadership goes, then I don't see why you wouldn't be a conservative. Unfortunately, we do have a PR problem uh, on the right. And uh, I voted for President Trump, but President Trump doesn't really help the right's case when it comes to women, mm -hmm. uh, not just because of things he's said and done with women, but also I think a lot of moms especially hear him talk, hear him at his rallies. He's got a little bit of a, of a mouth and they're like, I don't, you know, I don't really want my kids listening to that. That's not who I want my kids to be. I wouldn't marry someone like that. And so I do think that he makes it a little bit difficult sometimes to make the case. Um, is that the odd catch-22 of almost everything Trump does? Because we talked yeah. about this briefly right before we started, where it's like the policies pretty much make sense, and if you can remove that from the tweets or the person, it's like he's actually had a ton of high-level women. Totally in the administration if you care if that's what you're looking at. Yeah. You know? It just makes it more difficult. I yeah. think that you're able to do it, but when the left has such a monopoly on media megaphones, when they have a monopoly on Hollywood, they have a monopoly on academia. I won't say monopoly, but they're controlling a lot of the messaging that comes out and they're they're good at PR. They're good at the emotionalism that not to be sexist, but appeals to a lot of women. And so you hear the rhetoric of Trump is putting kids in cages and he grabs women by the Genitals, and you're a woman, you're like, I can't vote for that. I can't do that. And so in order to separate some of the lies from the truth and separate the things that Trump has said from the good things that he's done for men and women, you have to think and you have to go a step further. You have to do your own research. And a lot of people, male or female, just don't want to do that. When you can read headlines by just swiping your thumb, why are you going to take the time to actually click on an article and then double check it and make sure that it's right? It's just harder to be a conservative for that very reason. It takes more effort. How do you cut through the clutter? I mean, that's one of the things that, especially when I go to colleges, that kids ask me all the time, like, how do you actually figure out what's true? Yeah. Because reading all of these articles, it's like, I mean, we know because they write them about us. And then it's like, well, I know what lies that. We're in there, so what, you, else are, what else are they lying to us about? I mean, you really have to try to go to the source if you can. If they said that someone says something, you have to actually go to the actual quote or the actual video. I mean, a perfect example of this is when President Trump, uh, just the other day, the, the clip of him saying or allegedly saying that asylum seekers were animals was circulating. I'm glad it you're was, bringing this up. Yeah, it was deceptively edited. And so in order for you, someone like Chrissy Teigen, who tweeted about it and said that, you know, he's awful. Okay, in order for you not to believe Chrissy Teigen, for, in order for you to not believe the tweet that she quote tweeted. And, and several Democratic candidates, by the way, tweeted yes. this also. So it's not just Hollywood celebrities, even though they know right. he wasn't. Just to be very clear here, he was not saying that asylum, that seekers, asylum are seekers are animals. He was specifically talking about MS-13. MS-13, yeah. which is a totally appropriate description of them. Um, but in order to realize that that's a lie, you have to jump through a lot of hoops. I mean, because say I'm someone on the left or say I'm someone in the middle and I see Dave Rubin or Ben Shapiro say, that's not really what he said. Well, why should I believe you anymore? So you have to go to the actual source. You have to go to actual reporting. It's more effort. That's something that you and I are probably willing to do because we know the game that they're playing, but a lot of people just don't know. But I also think that's why people are turning away uh, in, especially young people from mainstream media and from talking heads and listening to podcasts where there's conversations and when there's dialogue where there's nuance and where people are willing to say, you know, I don't know that much about this. Here's what both sides are saying. You hardly ever see that on the news. So I think, I think that's part of it. It's a change in the media landscape. Yeah.
Where do you think Trump fits in? I, I try not to do that much about Trump in general, but since you brought him up. Yeah. Um, where do you think he fits in with sort of the future of conservatism then? Because yeah. Because I can sense a little push and pull with you on him. Yeah, I mean, I voted for him and I think I'll vote for him again. It's mostly because I voted for him in 2016, mostly because lesser of two evils. Then I didn't think that he was going to uh, lead very conservatively. I mean, especially pro-life is a huge issue for me. Uh, he had just a few years earlier said he was pro-choice. He didn't seem to emulate any of the conservative or Christian values that I hold in my life. But then I looked at Hillary Clinton and I looked at how I felt like the country was torn apart by Barack Obama over the past eight years. And I was like, okay, someone who is going to probably advocate for legislation and surround himself with people that aligns more with my values or someone who I think is diametrically opposed policy wise to everything I believe. So I chose him and I think I would choose him again because again, I, not that I would ever vote Democrat and I've never been on the left, but if I were, say I were a centrist, I would be looking over to the left and saying, okay, this guy, I don't like what he says, don't like his personality, I think he's too brash, and sometimes he doesn't make any sense, he calls Tim Cook Tim Apple, okay. <laughs> yeah, like he's a little embarrassing, but then I look at people who are advocating for late-term abortion, open borders, and socialism, and I'm like, I like my babies and my private property, I think I'm gonna stick with Trump. And so, yeah, I'm even more so in that camp because I am a conservative, and I do care about the future of the country, and I hate socialism, so of course I'm gonna vote for him again, and I think that's how a lot of people feel. Yeah, Still, that, sometimes a hard case to make. Yeah, that's how I see it. I mean, it's like, if you guys could just not be that bananas, they then, can't. then the refugees Cannot wouldn't be it. leaving you. But you right. just can't not be completely insane. No, they Give can't. Give us something here. Well, sometimes I wonder if it's a strategy. Are they taking us to the nth degree? Are they taking us to the, the most crazy Marxism that they can actually take us? Are they taking us to, for example, Medicare for all, just so we'll get on board with healthcare for all? Mm -hmm. Are they taking us to open borders just so we'll be okay with abolishing ICE? Are they taking us to, you know, killing babies outside of the womb to where we can say, okay, as long as it's to the second trimester because I, I mean I don't think that's going to work but I do wonder are you guys pushing us to the limits so we'll settle for something a little bit less but that's still liberal I don't know yeah I mean I Maybe suppose I suppose that could well you know mm. I don't know what the answer is but I suppose they could be do I mean Trump does a little of that right you yeah. stake out something really far and then you come in I mean that's what negotiations are about yeah I don't know but watching these guys go off the deep end has been quite Scary. something and I so I mentioned to you a couple days ago on uh, on Twitter, so I, you've been hitting AOC pretty hard. And I think your arguments, you never attack her personally, you always go for policy, or for the, the context of Substance what she's of what talking saying, about. Yeah. yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about why you're not thrilled with AOC. Well, we hear a lot of people on the left saying, oh, AOC gets to y'all, she's really getting to y'all, and she really bothers you. And I'm like, yes, she really does. I'm not even gonna pretend like she doesn't especially bother me. She specially bothers me because she is representative of millennials, which she isn't really, but she's representative of the stereotypes of millennials, and she's a woman. And so she is claiming to represent all millennials and all women, and she is, espousing and saying everything that is so diametrically opposed not only to what I believe in but what is good for America and also like she just says dumb things just dumb it's not that okay she's crazy like I think Bernie Sanders is crazy but I think he's probably smart like he can make a pretty good argument she just isn't good she's not even good at fulfilling her own arguments and I think it's her it's the hypocrisy too of saying, well, no one has any legitimate concerns with me. No one has any mm -hmm. legitimate criticism. I'm going to pull this random tweet from this person with 10 followers and say, well, this is all of the right making fun of my shoes. This is all they've got. Mm -hmm. Well, no, there's been a lot of people asking you for dialogue and debate and to discuss ideas and policies and you refuse to. That's what bothers me. Yeah, so what do we do about that? Because the, the energy of the media, the focus, so much of it is on her. I agree, I don't think she's particularly bright. I think she has handlers that at times yeah. are writing her, look, she's not writing most of these tweets. Yes, maybe she types them out. But it's very clear, if you listen to her speak, the way she speaks and her uh, understanding of information is very loose. And then in, in Twitter form, she knows all these things about history and policy and all of these things. And the idea that she wrote the Green Deal or any of that stuff, it's, no. just, it's just all nonsense. But what do you do if so much of the energy is focused there? Um, yeah. Which, which I, you know, I think we're in agreement, it's dangerous. Yeah. How do you move that if she won't debate? 
Yeah, I think that all you can do is advocate for your own policies and ideas the best way that you can. And yes, of course, to call out her lies and say, this is why it's a lie. I mean, you might not convince everyone, but maybe there is one person who thought that her tweet was awesome, looked at what you said and said, okay, well, maybe now I am starting to see a pattern of not just her, but people like her that use identity politics and use uh, this victimhood narrative, someone like Ilhan Omar as well, to say, oh, you can't criticize me. I'm seeing that a lot. Maybe her credibility comes into question. So I do think that's important. Important. I think it's important to keep it above board as much as we can with the criticisms. Now, I'm not necessarily good at that. Like yeah. sometimes I just want to. We all fail sometimes. Yeah, and yeah. I don't. I don't want to call. I mean, I don't think I ever go for anything super personal or ad hominem. But there are times where I just want to be like, this girl's an idiot. She's an idiot. Yeah. And I don't think that's that's probably just to call myself out. I don't think that's the most productive thing to do. We should probably say why she's wrong. Um, but someone who I think is actually trying to play her same game. Um, it's a little bit different because he's older and he's a man, but Dan Crenshaw is using social media mm -hmm. to his benefit mm -hmm. to actually talk about what's going on in Congress, say, here's the legislation I'm trying to get passed, here's what the Democrats are doing, here's the back and forth fight. We have hardly any transparency in Congress from the right. We don't have a young representative that's saying, okay, this is what you're hearing, here's what's actually happening. AOC is trying to do that, but you do have someone like Dan Crenshaw who's trying to do it on our side, and I think that's important. What do you think is the goal of this new crop of Democrats? Like, do you, like, to me, they genuinely genuinely want to change every fundamental law yeah. and every fundamental philosophy that has underpinned this country for over 200 years. I mean, yeah. I really, it sounds alarmist, it sounds conspiratorial, but I think they're deeply unproud of what America is. Yeah. Um, and it's very sad for me, as we talked right. about right before we started, it's like, this ain't the party of JFK anymore. Right, it was one thing when we just disagreed on policy, it's another thing when we disagree on patriotism, it's when we disagree that fundamentally America was founded on good ideas. Maybe you don't like the founder, founding fathers. Maybe you don't even like that they own slaves. Maybe you think that America has a bad history. We can probably agree on that, that America doesn't have a perfect history. But us not agreeing on basic constitutional values of individual liberty, of the rights that are endowed to us by our creator, that creates a whole other host of problems. We have not more complicated disagreements between this new crop, but uh, more fundamental disagreements, more simple disagreements than we've ever had before. That's what makes them so frustrating. And people uh, like me, like us, who care about American values and are down with the Constitution, it's really kind of mind boggling. Like we don't even know where to take their arguments sometimes. But when you look at what's coming out of academia, I mean, all this postmodern garbage, it kind of makes sense. I mean, they've been taught that America is this imperialist aggressor and everywhere boots have been on, American boots have been on the ground. Uh, evil has spread and white nationalism has spread. That's what they're learning. You're like, okay, I can see where they got that. It's sad because it's inaccurate. Um, but I think that's kind of where it's coming from and that's what they're promulgating. Yeah, are there parts of the right that you're not happy with? Uh, definitely, I mean, if the alt-right is even still a thing, I feel like it's kind of had its heyday. I literally pray that it's had. Of course, I don't like them. I think they're a bunch of internet trolls. There are people also who think that the world, the West is going to be won back through memes. I don't think there's anything wrong with memes. <laughs> Nothing wrong with memes. <laughs> don't piss but, off the uh, meme makers, No, I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but I don't think that's primarily where the where the battle is fought. And then I do get frustrated with people who can't ever criticize Trump when he says things, for example, and this was a while ago saying, okay, we'll take away their guns and then due process or something like that, or where they can't uh, refute him on trade, they can't push back at him at all, or they try to paint him into like, this almost demigod savior, that bothers me because, okay, let's not pretend that he's Ronald Reagan. He might've even done better things than Ronald Reagan in a lot of ways, but let's not pretend that who he is as a man is Ronald Reagan, that he represents all of our conservative values. I think it's okay to say, you know what, as a Christian, I don't really agree with a lot of the things that he says, a lot of the things that he's done. I still like his policies, but I'm just gonna be honest that I don't love everything that he's done. The people that will not say that that, that bothers me. I just don't get it. Do you think that there's uh, like sort of a sickness around the cult of personality related to our politicians, the way we talk about them and think about them? I mean, so you could take that with Trump from certain people, you know, the certain just diehard MAGA people who would never find fault. And you could take that with the obsession with, oh, there's Beto with his shirt rolled up, standing on a table and skateboarding. Yeah. And just the way we talk about them, like they're all celebrities or that, that they have the wherewithal to yeah. fix all our problems. It all actually feels gross to me. Like politics 
feels very gross to me for someone that yeah. talks about it as much as I do. Yeah. I don't know if it's because it's gotten so dramatized that it almost feels like our favorite soap opera. You know how someone has a character that they just love and can do no wrong. They're like, I'm, I'm fighting for this person in this show. It's almost that our, our politics have become so celebritized, which really almost started with Barack Obama, and so dramatized that people have picked their favorite characters and they feel like they have to pick one. And there's there's no <laughs> it's way. Like Pokemon. Basically. Yeah, there's no way that they're going to pick the other one. But I also think it has to do with the fact that they see their enemy as so bad, as so crazy, as so radical. And the left is beating up on Trump so much and so unfairly that they, they, I think they're honestly thinking, and maybe with good intentions, why would I pile on that? Sure, maybe I don't like some of the stuff that he does, but we never hear any of the good that he does, so I'm gonna be a part of the group that talks about the good that he does and not the bad. So maybe, maybe those intentions are pure. Yeah, so I, I do agree with that. I think that there's a certain set of people that think, well, wait a minute, this guy is relentlessly getting attacked and lied about and Russia yeah. investigations and everything else. So when he says something, like to me, the, the one that you hit on, uh, the, we'll take away the guns first and then the due process, to me that probably is the worst thing that he has said in, in the two plus years. Yeah. And I could see why a decent person that would know that that's wrong wouldn't go crazy about it because A, he probably was yeah. probably just like sloppy language, maybe, right? Yeah. Maybe. But B, it's like everyone's attacking the guy constantly, like cut him some slack. But I guess that, yeah. there's, a, there's a danger in that too. Yeah, and I think it's that they look at his actions. They keep saying, or I should say we, we look at his actions. Like, do I think that he is ideologically pro-life? Do I think he really cares about abortion? Probably not. Now, maybe he's been awakened to like a lot of people have with the New York law and the Virginia bill that didn't get passed and said, OK, that's really bad. But I don't really care what he personally thinks about abortion because he's been a, a pro-life advocate. And I think that's a good thing. And I want him to advocate for the things that I believe in. And I always knew and I was always pretty confident in the fact that even if he's not an ideologue, which I think we all knew that he wasn't, he was going to surround himself by people that would push the values and the policies that conservatives believe in. And that's, nowadays, that's really all I care about. Almost all, I wouldn't say all, but that's most of what I care about, enough to get my vote. So is that the irony, I guess, for Christian conservatives, is that you needed a guy that was gonna do, uh, play a dirty game? And, and maybe you couldn't get Romney or McCain. Yeah, or I when mean. they tried it the other way, like those guys weren't gonna play in such a way because it's not just that you're fighting the candidate, you're also fighting yeah. the media establishment and the colleges and all that. That's not how I thought of it because I didn't vote for him in the primaries. I didn't like him in the primaries. I actively talked about not voting for him in the primaries. And I honestly didn't understand